Uh, hello, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Maria Lin. Um, I am the founder and executive director of Mashad al Rabia in Chicago. Um, I am a, a community organizer um, as a uh, national leader with the Believers Bailout and a citywide leader in Chicago with the Grassroots Alliance for Police Accountability. I have about 15 years of experience in the field as an activist, as an advocate, as a community organizer, um, and have spent the last five of those years working um, especially within um, radically inclusive Muslim spaces, being LGBT affirming and uh, women-centered, and um, in uh, police accountability and prison abolition work, um, primarily within the greater Muslim community. Um, I'm gonna be talking about uh, radical accessibility, which is organizing strategy that we've developed in, um, developed over the years um, in trying to build a community that doesn't leave anyone behind. And so radical accessibility is a theory of organizing that centers the elimination of any and all barriers to the equal rights, agency, and freedom of movement for all people. And this begins with a radically accessible movement with making our own uh, communities and movements and events accessible. And it ends with using those strategies to create a radically accessible world. Now, to open, I can tell you a bit about what Mashad al Rabia is and what we do. Um, up on the screen, I have a picture of the Mashad al Rabia logo, which was made by um, For the People's Artist Collective in Chicago. Um, we are the we are a women-led, LGBT-affirming, radically inclusive, and pluralist mosque based in Chicago, Illinois. We have a prison ministry that encompasses more than 500 um, LGBT Muslims in prisons and jails and detention centers across the United States. Um, if we include uh, free world volunteers and participants and organizers, that congregation goes to over 1,000 people. Um, we uh, recently opened an office in downtown Chicago to be the first women-centered mosque in the Americas to open an independent location and the only transgender mosque in the Western Hemisphere. Please prove me wrong. Someone prove me wrong on that one. Um, and we have gone through a um, significant growth over the last two years since we opened our doors in 2016 as a prayer space um, operating out of a church basement. And over the last two years, we have grown into a prison ministry with over 500 people on the inside, um, hosting prayers every week, um, to hosting community events across the city, um, developing national partnerships to create programming and advocacy and emotional support for LGBT Muslim youth. Um, we moved into uh, to be organizing partners in the Believers Bailout, which um, bails out Muslims from uh, Cook County Jail the people who are locked up just for the crime of not having enough money. And now we are beginning to expand that conversation with the Believers Bailout from a local one to a national one as we go through that expansion. Um, our mission is to foster in an Islam that leaves no one behind. And every day we figure out how we can best fulfill that mission and it informs not only our day-to-day -day practice, but it informs our politics, it informs every event that we have, every conversation, um, to disrupt those top-down models of spiritual authority and instead entrust leadership from within. Um, something that is, I find, unique to faith-based organizing, especially faith-based organizing that is um, heavily informed by um, social justice movements, is that there is an urgency to the work because um, for me, Islam is the most important thing in my life. Um, and the, the thought that there are other Muslims in the world 
um, who do not have access to the faith, who are pushed out of their communities, who are marginalized just because of who they are or where they are is completely unacceptable. Because if this is the truth of the world, then to de deny it to someone is a cruelty that could not be endured. And so that has informed our, our organizing strategies, which into the secular organizing world, it means we come from a reminder that this work is life and death. It's something that is far more apparent to the people in this room that, that disability justice is not a concept, it is not a, um, a, a thought experiment. It is not an academic subject. It is life or death. It is our lives and our deaths. And we need people to acknowledge that every movement is life and death. That social justice work, that a movement towards a radically inclusive world is a matter of saving lives every day or working to prevent people from, from, from dying. And so, we strive to build a radically inclusive movement because to create a space where not everyone is, um, where it is not accessible to every person, if there is not a recognition of the agency and freedom of movement of all people within your community, then it is not a just movement. It is not a just organization. It is your, if your space is not intentionally trying to take down these barriers and um, create safer spaces for everyone in your community, then it is a moral and ethical failing as much as it is a organizational failing. And so when we talk about creating a radically inclusive movement, um, we look at the way that things are set up right now and the way that they could be or should be. Um, the model that most organizations use now in organizing is, um, is, is what, they, what they call retrofitting accessibility. Um, when you retrofit a building, you're um, trying to change it to make it more accessible. And so the way that, the, that movements tend to work right now is um, they attempt to work within the system to modify currently existing structures to make them accessible. It's um, taking every building in a city that only has stairs and installing an elevator or a ramp where the architect didn't intend it. Um, and this method of organizing, this method of creating accessibility is, will fail necessarily, it does not work. And so we strive towards revolutionary accessibility where we work from the ground up with accessibility as the foundation from which every other um, aspect of the organization and every other aspect of the movement is born from. That accessibility needs to be the foundation and the framework by which we build our organizations by which we build our movement because otherwise if we try to just fit accessibility into the structures that are already there it will leave people behind and so you have to ask yourself that this is not just this is not just about um, accessibility for people with disabilities or um, accessibility for people with certain disabilities. There is a need to um, uh, to understand that accessibility is, is more than about disability. It's about economic accessibility. It is about geographic accessibility. Um, um, it's about economic, um, academic accessibility. It's a matter of asking who is not in the room or who is not on the way. And you have to ask who isn't in the room, you have to ask why. That's the only way that you can begin to create a structure that is radically inclusive, that is inclusive of everyone. Because if you, as a community organizer, as an activist, as an advocate, this works in this work, you take on a responsibility. 
and it is not a responsibility that you can take lightly. That we need to recognize that if you fail to support members of part of your community, of anyone, then you have, you have committed a, a moral and ethical and organizational failure. This is a matter of life and death and we need to take it seriously. So when we ask this question, you really need to search who is not in the room and why. The radical accessibility and rad radically inclusive strategies are about the elimination of any and all barriers within our movements. And so, as we build these radically inclusive movements that are inclusive of everyone, I can speak about the work that we do in Mashar Arabia as we show up every day and try to create a Muslim community that is non-hierarchical, that disrupts the top-down models of spiritual authority, that is pluralist rather than declaring a particular theology, as we build a Muslim movement that does not leave anyone behind and practice an Islam that is radically inclusive and radically accessible. All of this work that we're doing is not just looking internally to um, uh, it's not just looking internally to make sure that our movement is morally, morally and ethically sound and accessible and inclusive. Um, it's also about looking towards a radically inclusive world. Because what this is really about, what radical accessibility is, as a theory is about, is cr making our movements, our communities stronger and more effective and truly inclusive to include everyone, to not leave anybody behind because we want to create a better world in which nobody is left behind. So we need to change our own organizations, change our internal work, change the movements that we are a part of so that we can begin to change the world and center that elimination of any and all barriers to the agency, equal rights, and freedom of all people. So through a framework of, of radical accessibility, disability justice is necessarily a prison abolitionist perspective. It is necessarily anti-fascist, calls for open borders, dismantling of police, prison abolition. It is a call for free and comprehensive health care, including mental health care, and it is a call for basic income, eliminating barriers to access, to freedom of movement, to the rights and agency and dignity of all people. It is a global movement. It is not just within our communities. It's not just making the building next door accessible so, so you can get in, or even just if people that look like you or are in your community can get in. It is about creating a, a better world that is safer and accessible and inclusive for all people. That this cannot end with ourselves. It cannot end with our organization. It cannot end with our town. It cannot end with our state. It cannot end with our country. It cannot end with our language. It cannot, it cannot end until we have fostered in a world that doesn't leave any of our siblings behind. Now, that's everything I have prepared to say. That's the, the soapboxing that I got done with. Um, the way that we do things at Mashad al-Rabia um, is that we, um, everything we do is working to disrupt the top-down model of spiritual authority and the ways in which leadership turns out looking like um, one person standing at the front of the room while everyone else faces the other direction and the person says this is this and that is that 
exactly what's been happening in the last 20 minutes. Um, and so the way that we lead our, our programming, our events, everything that we do is informed in a community-led endeavor um, where instead of looking to leadership in the front of the room, we entrust leadership from within and promote leadership within each other and from within. So I would like to open up to, to, to have some discussion here or questions. I can act as a resource. If you're moved to say something, please do. Um, and uh, I know it takes a minute sometimes to work up, so there will be like a brief silence, and that is perfectly OK. That's good. Um, that if you have any questions, if you have statements, ideas, please please let me know, or let us know. Hi, uh, Nora with ASAN. Uh, full disclosure, I am also a board member of Majid al Rabia. Um, <laughs> so to get things started off, so what are, so, so in terms of like who's not in the room and how do we get them here, what's some of the work that the mosque has been doing to radically include people with intellectual and developmental disabilities? Um, we have been, um, as a matter of addressing um, academic and intellectual accessibility, we've been finding ways and working with our wonderful board members <laughs> um, about um, being able to put our literature and our ideas and the things that we promote in plain language and um, be able to have, um, have all of our information accessible in as many forms as possible. If we have audio or video, there's a transcript accompanying it. Um, as we um, host events and grow, um, it's something that we are continually growing and learning. We are a young organization. Um, and so most of it is learning by doing, is act, asking and listening and checking in as we implement things to make them as, uh, to make sure that we're doing things well and to see how we can improve. Yes. Uh, the question I have is dealing with uh, people who, because of their disability, their age, or their geographic isolation, such as with indigenous people, people who have been denied access, I'm sorry, people who have been denied access to broadband, people who uh, are computer illiterate, people who do not go on the internet. So uh, in the current situation, I tell people, I still live in the 20th century. I don't live in this century because I'm, I'm pretty much computer illiterate because of education and uh, disability. So I, I was wondering if you had any ideas on how to uh, deal with that uh, lived experience of being computer illiterate in this current uh, uh, age. Thank you. Um, one of the things that we have learned and developed um, over the course of our prison ministry is that um, a majority of the people that we serve being um, incarcerated in the United States, which is a uniquely cruel system of isolation and alienation um, and violence, um, most of our uh, brothers and sisters and siblings on the inside do not have access to any form of digital communication. And so we have developed um, all of the programming that we do and um, uh, community events, information and exchange has been um, relayed entirely through the US postal system. Um, so we, um, 
uh, recently um, we're in the process of facilitating a marriage through the mail um, for two uh, siblings in the same institution who want to get married, um, but the system obviously is not letting them. Um, and so we've used that model of um, an entirely analog system of communication and, and education and advocacy to um, work towards uh, or support our free world congregation who does not have the, um, the same digital access as, as um, a lot of the world does. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Dessa from Detroit Disability Power. I, um, I just want to appreciate, I really like the model that you're talking about. I really like the way that um, you're working at so many levels of um, systems change, including the spiritual level. I, I find that really refreshing. Um, and I just was kind of wondering if you could speak a little bit about the organizations that you collaborate with um, and, and how they receive, you know, where you might have points of intersection with, with some of those organizations, how they receive other parts of what you're saying and, and trying to model yourself and if it's how that is helping them grow as organizations or where you're finding that challenging in terms of accountability. Um, Meshed Arabia is um, an interesting place and an interesting organization in that most of the work that we do is unprecedented. Um, I mean, we're a transgender-led, women-centered, LGBT-affirming mosque in, uh, in Chicago, in the United States, in this world. Um, and so much of what we've done has been kind of writing our own rules. And largely, um, we have over time become an institution in Chicago. We work in coalition with other more traditional mainstream Muslim organizations, with other LGBT groups and feminist groups. And the way that we have done that is just by showing up and doing the work every day. I said with faith-based organizing, there is an urgency to it and there is a passion to it because it is he said it, it, it's life or death. It is, it is moral and ethical and spiritual responsibility. And so by just showing up and doing the work every day, we have um, gotten loud enough that uh, people can't ignore us anymore. <laughs> um, essentially, just we have become indispensable in the city for the services that we provide on a national scale. Um, as we work, I mentioned the Believer's Bailout, um, that is a uh, broad coalition organization between um, Mashhad al-Rabia and Power Exchange, Inner City Muslim Action Network, and the Nation of Islam to uh, support um, Muslims who are um, held on bond in jails because this issue is far greater than any um, any distance between us in terms of identity. There was um, another, uh, an important part of this kind of organizing strategy is making the shift away from identity-based organizing and moving into issue-based organizing because identity will always um, be limiting just by the matter of language and just by the matter of, of the way this world works, that we just need to focus on the things that are important, that better world that we see that we can achieve and working towards that and building coalitions um, that regardless of, of who we are um, to work together towards that better future. on. Yes. I got good morning. Good morning. My name is Timotheus Gordon and I mean I'm autistic self-advocate from the Chicagoland area and my particular question I think he painted like a um, fruit disability justice a world free of um, anti-fascism and also Prima free of the barriers that we face as not only a disability community in general, but also um, marginalized communities within the disability community as well. And I was wondering whether it's through 
your own work for your organization or just in general, what would disability justice um, look like? Or what can be examples of it through arts and culture? Um, yeah, thank you for, for bringing that up because that's another really important part of the movement building is, um, is having that intersectional approach to who is not in the room, that it's not just a physical question of, of, of who isn't here and it's not just an economic one, but it's one of history and power and um, being in a, a, a country in a world that's seeped in white supremacy and anti-blackness um, and understanding how to, uh, one, how to confront it, and also how to um, build a movement that not only addresses it, but is actively resisting against those power structures. That um, resisting a patriarchal Muslim world um, and the, these like cisgender heterosexual male power structures, it's not just about um, those men not being leaders anymore. It's about empowering women and empowering LGBT people and gender nonconforming people to, um, to empower coming into our own leadership and to empower one another to come into leadership um, despite the systemic barriers that are there. It starts with naming it and it starts with, it, with asking questions and um, again, listening, uh, continuing to check in, and um, there's a like a um, a removal of ego and personality out of the of the process, and understanding that the movement is greater than any one of us or our own perceptions or biases that um, we have a theory of, of uh, like religious pluralism, of, um, of that diversity, of, of not proclaiming that our practice is Sunni or Shia or Sufi, but, but to be all of them. And there is a need for a um, political pluralism to um, fill in the gaps from what is um, left behind by just the limitations of being people. It's, um, I have a question about police. So um, there are many Muslim police officers, and I think they're wonderful. Um, how would we deal with that? information. I'm um, in New York, but this is true across the country. Um, I think that starts with recognizing that um, the narrative of uh, good cops and a few bad apples or um, knowing people that are good and, th and that narrative is broken because this is, it's not about a system of individuals. It is about a system of power and a system of enforcement of these um, huge sy systemic problems that um, there is no fixing the system of police today and the prison industrial complex. There is no retrofitting that system to make it better or safer for the people that it targets today because it is born into it, regardless of the individual. Again, this is something that, that is greater than people. That um, when I talk about um, police and I talk about prison abolition, it's not just about saying that um, we look at the world as it is, only there are not police and there are not prisons. It's looking at a complete reevaluation of the way that we prioritize our communities, where instead of investing in arming police and building prisons and locking people away um, for, for crimes of circumstance, 
instead investing in our communities in education and comprehensive health care and creating a society in which our communities can be empowered to uplift one another instead of um, turning our communities into um, oppressive war zones and um, locking people away when we could be empowering one another and using the many, many resources that go towards state violence and instead going towards uplifting our communities. And I've got five or so minutes. If my, yeah. Um, so yeah, this work, I've been doing this for, um, I've been an activist and community organizer for about 15 years. I've been involved in um, inclusive Muslim spaces for about five. And um, I think one of the, um, the important things to remember as we move out of this room, as we think about employing these, these concepts to, um, is to understand that we as people and as movements are always growing and always developing and always getting better. If we make the commitment to get better, if we make the commitment to not go back on our communities, to not um, sell members of our communities short, but it takes a daily commitment. It takes every, every moment, every action that you do has to be intentional. Because if you let yourself fall passively into other situations, then power takes over. And so it's important to know that you have permission to get better every day. And it is also an imperative for everyone in the room to get better every day. Um, Imam Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, said that um, uh, to remain silent in the face of oppression is to be an oppressor yourself. And so it begins with the thought, and it moves next to speech. And the Quran says to strive in the way of Allah with your life and with your wealth. So everything that we do, striving towards the movement, striving towards justice, use everything that we have to make that movement towards justice, whether it be your wealth, whether it be your skills, whether it be your connections, whether it be your talents. Every single person is uniquely suited to bring justice in their own life. And you just have to ask the question, what can I do and how can I help? Right. Um, I've got my contact information up here if anyone would like to reach out. Consider me a resource. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you.